Batman as a paranoid jerk is a pretty expected trait nowadays. The story which popularised this was... This image of Batman standing above the entire Justice League doesn't just symbolise what Tower of Babel is about, but has come to define the cultural imagination of who Batman is. He's the self-made god who's more dangerous than the more literal ones. He's the adult among children. He's the emo around the happy. However, there's also something that's lost over time. Something which, ironically, the film adaptation has become an example of. And that's... Everyone is back! The entire DCAU Justice League voice cast, except it's Tim Daly, not George Newborn for Superman. And because this was after the New 52, Hal Jordan and Cyborg were also there, which is kind of f***ing name if you ask me. Nathan Filling is cool and all, but come on, it's Phil Lamar's the man. You're the famous Jon Stewart, father of- You wanna shut up? Michael Rosenbaum also plays Barry Allen now, as opposed to Wally West, which also kind of just sucks, because his natural charisma isn't mined properly. Later, Margie. Have a good one. Later, Tony. Where you going? Train station. And this was also the last written work of Dwayne McDuffie, who's just awesome. As a result, one of the biggest strengths of the film is its natural confidence and craftsmanship. It's a solid film on its own terms. Thus, as time has passed, especially after the passing of Kevin Conroy, it's something that you can easily hold dear. It's an artifact of an old era of DC animations before everything changed and then changed again. But at the same time, these two are two totally different things. First of all, there's a lack of suspense to the film. We follow the story pretty chronologically. We see the plans stolen, the plans enacted, and the characters deal with it immediately afterwards. It's blunt and it's theatrics. I know you're probably asking, how else are you supposed to do it? The comic starts in the middle. Batman is immediately taken off the board when his parents' bones are stolen. So we follow the characters, the League, as they face the escalating confusion and terror of these sudden, really effective and efficient ambushes on them, with no guidance from Batman to near the end. As a result, the reveal that all this horror happened because of him is even more surprising, and more importantly, it builds a feeling of shame. The story is five issues. The third is a flashback one, depicting not only how Talia stole the plans, but how Batman used personal conversations to construct his plans. One of my personal favourites is when Kyle and Bruce sat down in the meeting room. Batman is genuinely interested in what he's drawing, and he praises his friend with his attention to detail. Kyle asks, I think about it sometimes. Which would you regret losing more? Your hearing or your vision? You can't count on vision to save you from the enemy who's behind you. You know man, most people who are as paranoid as you end up getting professional medical help. Me? I would sure hate to never hear music again. But without my eyes? No beauty, no art, no way to create with a pencil or power ring. I not only wouldn't be Green Lantern anymore, I don't think I'd even make a very good Kyle. Batman's contingency for Kyle was then subsequently blinding him with hypnosis, knowing that it would break his spirit. Conversations like these is what's lacking in Justice League Doom. Moments which show that Batman doesn't get it. He's so busy literally looking after his own back that he doesn't allow himself to be the best version of himself, like Kyle is. Instead, he's assuming everyone will become worse. He has a lack of shared vision. But this difference is also why Bruce loves them, why he loves the League, why he has these chats, why he needs these chats. Batman is someone torn in this comic. The existence of his contingencies isn't the ethical problem, it's the dilemma of his lack of reciprocatory trust. With his friends, Bruce is one person, enlightened and smiling, but back home, he's alone. He chooses to weaponize the private thoughts of his friends to personally attack them. It's kind of like the professional and personal equivalent of keeping a diary that records all your friends' insecurities and personal problems, and then creating instructions on how to attack them with it one day. Alfred even questions if it's appropriate for Bruce to do this in privacy, especially after Barry Allen who had just sacrificed himself. He argues this distance Bruce is creating surely would mean they'll take similar steps against him. But Bruce says if they aren't, they're being foolish. Batman is at a stage in his life where, despite his access to people, is trapped by his own unhealthy loneliness, which burdens him with a paranoia that denies him the ability to live with the acceptance he's given by his community. Bruce instead believes this violation is just normal. This is the tragedy of Tower of Babel. This cover is not supposed to invoke awesomeness, but shame. Batman's deep private feelings of, oh, I f***ed up, follows him for the rest of the story. There's even a beautiful moment where everyone just stares at him. 
but he tries to maintain the league's focus. And it feels sad. The League aren't stupid, they understand his intentions, in fact Marsh Manhunter himself has done a similar thing before with his own dossiers, but what they don't get is the very specific lack of trust. As the League votes on if Batman can stay or not at the end, Cal ends up saying Batman should stay, but Diana replies, You merely spoke your mind, Kyle, and I understand mankind's need for security. They may not like them devising safeguards against us, but I can't fault them for it. But neither do I rely on those people in the way I do my teammates. I cannot, I will not go into battle beside someone I do not trust. Someone who secretly studies me, scrutinizes my weaknesses as intently as he acknowledges my assets. I fully believe Batman never meant his contingency plans to be abused, but he could have told us they existed without detailing them, because I can never fight again with confidence alongside a man so secretive. His presence now weakens the League, and those we defend needs us always to be our strongest. With regret, I vote for exclusion. In the film, she just says, We use our power to protect the world. We always have. Yeah, that, that's it. That's an amazing argument. The characterization of the League being good intelligent people deserving of his trust and can separate their personal feelings with their professional ones is what's really missing in Doom. None of us would ever do that to you. Then you're damn fools. There's fun banter, but the feelings of shame that should hang over Batman's side is just non-existent. This characterization of Batman trying to keep it together, trying to redirect the focus away from his own overwhelmed heart and back on the mission is replaced by him keep saying, well if you don't see it my way then you're the problem. And the film cuts away before the League can say more than two lines. I'm not sure I have a problem with Batman's contingency plans, but letting somebody steal them was pretty damn dumb. Tell me why. Of uh, my reasons, but I'm no happier than you that Raish decrypted my computer files. Our sympathies are marginal. How much does Raish know about me now? About all of us? And what will he... he do? Justice League Doom would rather let Batman become a jerk than show the full picture of what he did wrong in order to protect his dignity. If you people can't see the potential danger of an out of control Justice League, I don't need to wait for a vote. This in turn takes away a lot of his humanity, so this multi-dimensional man who's not just a self-made god who prepares for everything, but is also a brother, a friend, a loving member of a community is now presented as someone who never really cared about anyone at all, and just sort of stares all the time. However, this also is where the film sort of works in its own solitary way. Just League Doom at its core isn't about the complexities of loneliness and paranoia, but pride shared by all the characters. The villain this time isn't Raish and his eco-terrorism plans, but Vando Savage, who's looking to destroy and remake the world out of a sense of nostalgic pride. Both Batman and Savage are hubris in the way they only believe in themselves and can't see their own dangers. With all that talk about unchecked power, you're still so arrogant you didn't bother to come up with a plan to stop yourself. This detail is what the film hops on way more than the comic. As a result, a different theme is thus produced. The existence of these plans is not about the conflict of trust, but a conflict of pride, where the difficulty of accepting your own flaws is what balances pride. Batman leaves and admits his plans for himself was the League. He knew they could take him down like any other villain. Furthermore, during the whole film, he had been going out of his way to bring Cyborg along with the team. Victor, unlike him, is a real team player, has way better tech skills, and is a fundamentally better person than him. Batman looked after the League by ensuring them of his own replacement. In conclusion, the paranoia displayed in Tower of Babel was an example of Batman's immaturity, his carelessness, the way he took his friends for granted. As a result, at its core, it was a story about Batman and the Justice League as people whose heart can be torn. Justice League Doom is about them as ideas, as literal gods, their dangers, their pride, and things that needed to be considered to prevent their pride to get the better of them. And you know what? I like the comic more. That's all I wanted to say.
also noted that Batman's actions in the comics had rippling effects. The League stopped using Oracle and Dick and Tim are treated with suspicion on the Titans. Batman tries to spin this as a good thing, that will make them stronger, but it's all clearly BS. He knows he's ruined everything. And he's kind of sad about it too.